But Women Worth and Wellness is a brand that was created in 1994, so it's almost 30 years old. And the focus was primarily on boomer women and their daughters. But 30 years later, it's boomer women, their daughters, and their granddaughters. And it's an equal focus on health and wealth. I was a wealth advisor at the time, and I found that a lot of wealth-related issues are really health-related. And I think coming through COVID, we know more than ever that our health is job number one. It's the number one priority. But we also focus on net worth and self-worth. We know we want to feel good about ourselves. And we know that mental health is a big issue coming through COVID. So <clears throat> again, it's not a topic that we've addressed yet, but certainly probably something for the fall series. And also philanthropy and legacy planning and giving back. And so again, coming through COVID, <clears throat> we never know when something tragic could happen to us. So having all of your affairs in, or in order is extremely important. Today, the topic's long-term care. We know that coming through COVID, a lot of things were exposed that people had known were problems, <clears throat> excuse me, for some years, but had not been addressed. A famous saying is from uh, Warren Buffett. He says, you never know who's wearing a bathing suit until the tide goes out. Well, of course, we never knew how bad some of, how some of these conditions were until <clears throat> COVID presented some really challenging issues. <clears throat> Today, we've got three terrific speakers, um, each of whom is an expert in their area. Karen is spending a lot of time working with advisors as they work with their clients. Moira has written a book, and uh, Crystal's going to tell you about how you can access this. It's Happily Ever Older, and of course, we all say Happily Ever After. And then we have Nancy. It's always important to have a Nancy wherever you go. Nancy's from Pittsburgh and she's an expert on aging. So you're gonna have a continuum presentation. And so submit your uh, questions because we'll have time for them at the end. Before we go any further, I will say a special thank you to our um, sponsors. We wouldn't be able to do these events, um, bring them to you at no charge if we didn't have sponsors. Both the Cheese Gallery and uh, Georgian Hills uh, Winery have been sponsors since 2019. And uh, last year on March the 11th, 2020, we were doing a big in-person event with over hundred women present. Casey was doing the catering and talk about a loaves and fishes lady. I kept saying, can we accommodate five more? Can we, it was a wonderful event, but ironically enough, March the 11th is a day we'll always remember. And our theme that day was 2020 perfect vision for the road ahead. Didn't have a clue what was gonna happen. Uh, Paul Chapman has come on board as the Wealth Advisor sponsor for the Spring Series. He uh, spent most of his time in Toronto, having moved there from Flesherton, and like a lot of people, he's moved back to his roots and setting up his practice in Collingwood, and it's been a great pleasure to work with Paul. So if anybody needs a second opinion, definitely I would recommend him. So all of that being said, Crystal, over to you to introduce our panelists, each of whom is amazing. And it will be a continuum with Q and A's at the end. Wonderful, thanks, Nancy. So we, Women Worth and Wellness, we are very honored to bring you this important and engaging talk on long-term care. It's planning for the vision of your future. So first of all, we're gonna start with Karen. Karen's father died of the flu 20 years ago in long-term care. As a result of this life-changing dementia care experience, Karen founded the Long-Term Care Planning Network Canada's leading resource center for aging and long-term care planning and education. And her seminar series, website and print tools are recognized as key long-term education resources for Can Canadians, their families and their professional advisors. So we're really lucky to have her with us today. And then we're followed up with Maura. Maura Welsh is the author of Happily Ever Older, as Nancy pointed out, the revolutionary approaches to long-term care and this book really talks about evolving ways to live in our later years. She's able to offer this incredible book to you today at a special discount of 25% off. And I will be putting links to all of our speakers and our sponsors in the chat for you so that you can follow up with them. She's an investigative reporter with the Toronto Star and has written extens extensively on seniors issues with a focus on long-term care, along with issues related to social justice, health and the environment. And last but definitely not least, we have Nancy Zions, CEO and 
Chief Program Officer for the Jewish Healthcare Foundation. She's responsible for the grant agenda for the foundation and operating arms with areas of focus, including aging, long-term care, and the end of life. So the Jewish Healthcare Foundation read that it released an incredible, oh my goodness, released an incredible documentary, What COVID Exposed in Long-Term Care. And we all know there was a lot. Um, if you didn't see it in the event listing, there was a link to the YouTube video. I'll post it here for you as well. But it uh, that along as many other incredible studies and publications come from them. And we look forward to hearing from all of them. So without further ado, as we mentioned, please put any comments in the chat. We will address them to the speakers as we go along or at the end, but we'll go along with them. And we're gonna start with Karen first, Karen Henderson. Good afternoon. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, you can. Great, okay, thank you very much. When I Googled the phrase, how to make your golden years truly golden, I got everything from creating a budget to changing your diet to finding a new man. Not what I had in mind. What I had in mind and have had in mind for over 25 years, is educating yourself about what lies ahead as you age. No one else is going to do it for you and how well you prepare for your aging years will dictate how truly golden they are. A few words about my dad who is responsible for this passion of mine. He died of the flu 20 years ago in long-term care the care back then was unacceptable. There wasn't enough staff. There weren't enough uh, hands-on uh, hours of care, terrible meals. But I was ignorant about long-term care back then. I didn't know how home care worked. I assumed, I didn't know what a retirement home was and I assumed that all long-term care homes were the same. Uh, when I chose my dad's home, I never thought to ask who owns it. Um, and I never thought to ask about inspection reports. My dad was able to afford private care, which really saved us both because he was wheelchair dependent and I was traveling a great deal. Very few around us were so lucky. Very few understand what long-term care is and COVID has not helped. Most of us can't answer these questions. How long does long-term care, or sorry, how long does long-term does a long-term care system work, yikes. Where can I live happily and safely? How do I fund this? Does the government pay? Do I pay and how much? How and when do I start planning? And where do I go for information? Why don't we know the answer to these questions? Is it apathy? Is it confusion? Is it fear? Well, maybe it's because it's easier. We tell ourselves, I will remain healthy, I'm going to live a long time. My family will look after me. Well, have you asked them? The government will provide. Well, we know that that isn't true. Will you stay in your own home? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know how much it costs. I don't want to think about it. I can't think about it. Apathy, confusion, or fear. Long-term care has been around and talked about since COVID started uh, 14 months ago. Most people still don't know what it is. What is it? Well, it isn't cure. Uh, it's supposed to provide care. And most of this care is what we call custodial, not medical, providing assistance with basic uh, everyday activities that we call the activities of daily living. Now, long-term care can go on for many years and there is little government support. So how did things get so bad? Long-term care has gone from wicked before COVID to deadly after it. How could this happen in a good country like Canada? Well, firstly, there was a lack of government oversight, especially regarding the, the for-profit homes far too little recognition of the extent to which complex care has shifted away from hospitals to long-term care homes in the, in the last two decades, putting a tremendous pressure on long-term care. We've got an antiquated ward level accommodation system with crumbling infrastructure that should have been repaired 30 years ago. This has left long-term care homes feeling vulnerable and voiceless. 
We have a huge shortage of trained staff. They're underpaid, they're mistreated. We don't have any PPE, infection training, or facility inspections. Seniors and their families have not been listened to or heard for over 20 years. There is always the issue of inadequate, inconsistent funding. And quite frankly, society has looked away. Things have been very, very tough in long-term care. Usually every couple of months, there's some kind of explosion in long-term care, which the Toronto Star is very good at recording. Somebody gets murdered in long-term care. Somebody gets sexually assaulted in long-term care. People go crazy for a few days. The story dies down and it disappears and life goes back to normal. Society has looked away. The other reason that we don't understand long-term care is that we harbor these um, misconceptions that somehow prevent us from thinking we need care. I've all, there's a million of them and I've only gonna, I only have time for two. The first is I'm too young to need long-term care. The reality is that 40% of people receiving it are under 64 and accidents, chronic illnesses, and disabilities can happen to anyone at any time. Think Michael J. Fox, Parkinson's at 29. Think Selena Gomez, lupus. Another misconception, long-term care planning can wait. I've got lots of time. The reality is 50 is the ideal time to start planning for long-term care. Too many people wait until 65 or later when something has already happened. And, and so decisions are made and planning early can help avoid these decisions that one may later regret. COVID has decimated the long-term care system in this country, and it has decimated the long-term care continuum, which most people don't understand. The care continuum is the path that we travel through the long-term care system as we age and need more care and support. I don't have much time to go into it here, but it does begin with home and community care where seniors want to be, but we don't provide enough subsidized hours for many people to remain in their homes. Next is retirement assisted living. These are the privately owned chains. The names you may uh, recall or remember are uh, Sienna, Chartwell, Extendicare. These are for people who are independent and um, can purchase uh, care if they would like to do so. Next on the continuum is nursing, long-term care and memory care. And these are the homes that are owned by for-profits, not-for-profits and municipalities. They're legislated by the province. The government pays for food and care. The residents pay for accommodation. And finally in the continuum is palliative or end of life care. This is wonderful when you can get it in this country, but too few people have access to this patient or this palliative care patient guided care. Uh, and their job is to control pain and manage symptoms and support families. Something else that is very misunderstood by Canadians across the board is what governments do and do not subsidize. They subsidize physician and hospital di and diagnostic care because these are a part of the Canada Health Act. As we have seen, they subsidize a very limited number of home care hours. You're lucky if you get two per week. They subsidize food and care in long-term care. Residents pay their accommodation. They uh, provinces subsidize some senior services like physio and the federal government does pay for veterans long-term care. And I will say they do a great job. Not subsidized by provinces are retirement homes, no subsidies here, home adaptations uh, that may allow you to remain in your own home longer. Caregivers are not compensated for their work, even if they have to leave their jobs. Each province has a formulary which has a limited number of prescription drugs on it. Dentistry is not subsidized and very basic optometry may be subsidized by provinces. So when we're aging and we, we really need to think what's really important to us. 
And if somebody were to say to you, what is the most important thing to you as you age? A lot of people would probably say money and they're not wrong. But what it really is, it's independence. It is your most precious asset to maintain it in your 50s and 60s. Manage your legal directives, your powers of attorney and your will. Have a say about your care. In your 70s and 80s, manage your home. Downsize so that your family doesn't have to do it. I had to do it for my dad after 60 years, and it's a huge job. And in your 90s and 100s, stay connected. Spend time with others and maintain your purpose and hope. Social isolation happens to many people as they get older. And a great amount of research has proven how detrimental this is to one's health. So after living through COVID and everything else that's been going on around us, you may want to start asking yourself, do I want to go into a nursing home when my health fails? Or would I rather age in my own home with as much home support as needed? But if I can't remain at home, would I rather live with a few neighborhood people in a small shared home with good support that recognizes me as a person? I don't think it's too hard to answer these questions. So here is your action plan. Educate yourself and your family about the long-term care continuum wherever you live in this country. Understand the diseases that you face and how you're going to manage and pay for them. Have the care conversation with your family, with your advisors, and with your medical team. Make all your critical information, everything about you, accessible in one place to those who need to be able to see it. Plan how you will pay for your care. And finally, look after your health and stay out of the long-term care system for as long as possible. I always provide resources in presentations. Uh, Google the titles of these and you will um, read a lot about long-term care and aging in place, which is a huge issue. I, uh, one of my own resources is this, uh, it's never too early to start the care conversation, a guide for adult children and their parents. I am happy to offer it as a gift to those who are attending today. It will help families talk about long-term care, uh, sorry, about long-term care, and also how to hold a family meeting. All you need to do is send me your email address, and I will send you out a copy of this PDF resource. Here is my contact information. Thank you very much for attending today's important session, and there is a ton of great information to come. Thank you. That is wonderful. I just put your email into the comments there. So if you are looking for that resource, anybody, then Karen will email it back to you if you email and reach out to her. So next up, we have Maura. Hi. Hi, thank you so much. And Karen, that was such an interesting presentation. Happily Ever Older is a book I wrote, and it's really about hope. It describes a future where seniors can live very well in their communities, or for those who do become very vulnerable, they can live well in long-term care and assisted living and retirement homes. The reality is that nobody aspires to live in a nursing home, certainly not in traditional nursing homes, which are really basically institutions. We need far more community options for support. And I talk about these in my book, the NORCs, naturally occurring retirement communities, the so-called Golden Girls co-owned housing, home sharing, or tiny homes. And I've even heard of a group of friends who bought new built condos all on the same floor with plans to one day share support worker if that day ever arrives. But the way that we treat the most fragile amongst us, including those who don't have family caregivers, is a social justice issue. And it's possible to create small, intimate, long-term care households that enable people to flourish with friendship, purpose, and freedom to engage in our individual interests. 
That means, for example, living on your own schedule. If you sleep in until 10 a.m., that's fine. You can have breakfast whenever you wish to. If you want to spend the day in an artist's studio in, in the home, painting, working on sketches, that's great. Or step outdoors for a walk in the fresh air and have a glass of wine for dinner. The reality is that these ideas and these seniors' homes already exist. This is not magical thinking. And I hope my book will offer a call to action to reimagine how we live in our elder years. I wrote Happily Ever Older to push for change, but also to show our shared experiences as we search for care for our parents and ourselves. And unexpectedly, my parents grew fragile during my book research. They needed to move into a home with supports. So I wove their journey, our struggles, laughter, and ultimately our heartache throughout the chapters of my book. And it's a universal story. We live in a society dominated by ageism. We saw it exposed during the pandemic when so many elders struggled in the old institutional long-term care homes that didn't place their needs first. The outcome, in homes across North America and Europe led to devastation that will traumatize people for years. And in a different way, the pandemic has forced us to examine the way we treat others, especially seniors. Most of us have experienced isolation, so we can empathize now with people who spend their later years isolated and alone. Research shows that loneliness is a debilitating emotion that causes, but it also causes physical harm akin to heart disease and worse than obesity. So no one plans for a life in a nursing home, but for many reasons, often unexpected, some of us in the very large demographic of older people will need special care. As a journalist, I have spent a lot of time inside nursing homes, talking to families, residents, and staff. I've seen narrow hallways that look like cluttered storage space for equipment or residents sitting for hours with heads down as if they no longer exist. And staff who speak to each other over the heads of people in their care, but don't actually connect with the people who would love to have a conversation. And the way that we view society or the way that we as a society view elders is reflected in the way traditional nursing homes operate. And by that, I mean with ageism. So we will all benefit from the recognition that people who are lucky enough to live for a long time, don't lose their humanity as they grow old. So why not make it a great experience? I've been writing about long-term care for the Toronto Star since 2003, but my book research began in 2018 after the Star published my series called The Fix. I spent a year following the transformation of one dementia household in a nursing home just west of Toronto. It showed that it is possible to operate a household or a home that meets the medical needs of vulnerable adults, but enabling them to flourish socially and creatively, no matter what stage in life. And the response from readers was remarkable. There were emails and phone calls. People would stop me um, in the, the hallway, in the newsroom, um, but grandchildren emailed with you know, multiple exclamation marks and sons and daughters reached out asking the same question. Where can we find a home like that? And I realized from interviews with geriatricians, advocates, operators, and families that some had heard of some of these programs, these new ideas, some of which have existed actually for quite a long time, but most didn't know what they looked like in action. So for my book research, I wanted to give firsthand accounts based on detailed journalistic, journalistic reporting of what life is like in these different homes these progressive homes. And I, it, in, I visited individual homes with programs that had an existing track record of success, but these homes are also constantly evolving with new ideas, especially in the field of dementia care, which, where much of the current innovation is underway. And there's a growing demand for the rights of people with dementia to be in, included in, in homes, in communities, and, and the right to live with dementia and live well. So with the exception of the butterfly model, which has qualitative studies and data collected by individual households that show positive health outcomes, most of the programs have independent research. 
And in my book, I write about researchers discussing actually the challenges of measuring happiness or contentment, especially in a system that is focused on what is easier to quantify, the temperature of air and sealed buildings or the heat of the food. So starting in October, 2018, I traveled across North America and into the Netherlands to meet with leaders of individual nursing homes, retirement homes, and an enriched day program in San Diego. And I have to say, enriched day programs, I, I believe, are the key to many people staying in their homes with their families for a longer period of time because they offer respite to families and give people um, great stimulation during the day. So those are a really important piece that we often don't talk about. What is important to think about with all of these programs is the need to stay on them with focus. The leaders I met with are constantly working to uphold their philosophies so the home doesn't slip back into old ways. It takes work. Sue Ellen Beattie is the CEO of the Sherbrooke Community Center in Saskatoon. And she said that change can begin with leaders who treat their staff with warmth and kindness, offering them opportunities to feel valued, giving their roles purpose as an important part of the care team. And in turn, workers begin treating people in their care the same way. As the saying goes, if your staff are happy, your, your residents will be happy too. Sherbrooke uses a philosophy called the Eden Alternative, which is focused on the elimination of loneliness, boredom, and helplessness. And in many ways, this improves the lives of workers and the people they care for. In a time when long-term care struggles to find staff and retain them, homes that treat their workers well and give them purpose will be better able to attract and retain good staff. And Sherbrooke was among the first to build these small households that we're starting to talk about now. They're connected to its larger nursing home and they provided the inspiration for the widely known greenhouse project in the United States. These small homes also focused on the unique culture of their community with a home for indigenous people, veterans, or those of Ukrainian descent, for example. For some people, that cultural familiarity offers solace. So I met people who were living up to their late life potential. One woman at Sherbrooke needed to strengthen her leg after a stroke and the physiotherapist wanted her to exercise in the home swimming pool. Alice Cowell was her name, and she spent most of her life farming on a 700 acre farm in the middle of the prairies. She did not have any time for water sports during her life, but at the age of 91, she bought her first bathing suit and began swimming lessons. And she told me that she was petrified, but now she just loves it. In some homes like the Carol Woods Retirement Community in a North Carolina forest, are focused on the inclusion of people with dementia to daily life, providing freedom of movement to those who might otherwise be kept inside for the remainder of their days. Most of us have now heard of the studies that show the value of remaining connected to nature for our emotional and physical health. The CEO of Carol Wood told me the story of a resident, a man who was once in the CIA. He had dementia, and as many of us know, people with cognitive decline sometimes relive very vivid periods of their life, as if they're happening in real time. So every morning, this gentleman would get up early and go for a walk through the forest, and in his mind, the CEO told me, he was patrolling a dangerous area. And Carol Woods has a big community of residents who have cognitive decline and those who do not, so there are a lot of volunteers and many people, or at a, several people at a time, would walk with him or just behind him, giving him his space, making sure he didn't get lost. Now, I was told he marched through the forest for at least an hour every morning. And when finished, he'd stop at the CEO's office and tell her what he had seen, bombs that went off, snipers who were out there. And then finally, he would tell her whether or not she was safe to leave her office. And we, when retelling this story, the CEO made a powerful point. She said, can you imagine what he would have been like if he was inside a locked unit? In a traditional home, he would have spent his days sitting in a chair, possibly staring at the floor. He would have been bored, frustrated, and quite likely full of anxiety or anger, just like so many others who can't meet their individual interests during the day. I think it's fair to say that any of us would feel the same way. 
So Greenhouse was created by American geriatrician, Dr. Bill Thomas, who also started the Eden Alternative. Greenhouse has small homes of roughly 10 people with private rooms and washrooms. And a recent US study found that small households like Greenhouse with dedicated workers had fewer cases of COVID. Other operators are now starting to embrace small home designs that are meant to offer a sense of calm and familiarity even if they exist within a larger building. Many now believe that we should stop separating people with dementia, leaving them unable to interact with others of different abilities or see the natural world unfolding around them during the day. During my book research, I met with many residents, some of whom have dementia and some who do not. Obviously their lives were different than in their earlier days, but they were still engaged in their world. In an Atlanta nursing home, there was a closeness between workers and residents. At lunch, a woman who had been an English professor at a Georgia university during her career sat with a worker while everyone ate. They laughed and chatted across the table, lowering their heads together, plotting how to, to tease the in-house chef about his new girlfriend, and at the same time, get his recipe for chocolate cookies. The point of this detail is there was a natural ease and a closeness between these two women. And that shows that the, the goal of relationships directed care, but it also shows friendships that develop. Architecture plays an important role. The home's design has an emotional impact. Small households with workers dedicated to that specific group offer, offer feelings of familiarity and peace. There's a kitchen in each little household. So meals are cooked throughout the day. If staff feel like switching out um, the, the meatloaf for dinner and because the residents want a barbecue outside, that can happen. They sit at a table, pass around food, family style. Now, some of this changed during COVID, of course, but the big units of 32 people or more are built for efficiencies. And not many people who live there ever spent their adult lives in homes with 30 other people. So why do we think it's a good idea to take people who are at their most vulnerable, fearful of the changes they're experiencing with dementia and leave them in a unit with a few dozen other residents who all share the same frustration of a life with little purpose? When I was in the Netherlands, I visited two homes. The leaders I spoke with kept using the word normal. Eventually I said, what's up with being normal? And this was when I was at Tehogovic, which is a, a village design with tiny households. A normal life is what we want to provide, I was told. At, at, Tehovic, at Tehogovic, the manager said a normal life with small households, freedom to step outdoors or sit at a cafe, have a glass of wine with dinner, gives people comfort because it's similar to the way they always lived. In Langley, BC, a new village design combined the philosophies of the Hogovic and the Greenhouse Project. Before it opened, I interviewed the founder and we discussed his efforts to ensure people living there would have a natural life instead of a staid, safe existence or what some people call the surplus of safety in nursing homes. Like the Hogovic, Village Langley is an enclosed community with the freedom to move outside if you so desire. I think it has about roughly seven acres. So the founder wanted people to go outdoors whenever they wished, to garden, walk on the grounds, using technology to track their whereabouts if they didn't return for lunch. And he had plans for group time spent outdoors, with outdoor fire, roasting marshmallows. The homes I visited across North America didn't repeat that word normal like they did in the Netherlands, but that is essentially what they were offering. Nobody wants to live in long-term care but hopefully most of us can age with health and independence. But with effort, those who need that extra support can still live a very good life. So we're in a time of reckoning. I hope the stories told in my book will expose the fact that good care, good life experiences are already established in progressive homes. We just need to demand more options for our later years. And let's ask ourselves, if not now, then when? Thank you. Thank you very much, Maura. I will put links to your book in the chat. Is it only with that one location that 
offers the 25 percent or is that with all yes that 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 is a local bookstore in um toronto and um the others would be your your typical stores or you can also find it in your own local bookstore depending on where you live great so i will put a link to the local bookstore that's offering 25 percent, as well as some other links that you can get in online like amazon thank you so much nancy you are next please I am Nancy Zions. I am the Chief Operating Officer and Chief Program Officer of the Jewish Healthcare Foundation in Pittsburgh. And um, I am a Montrealer and the Jewish Healthcare Foundation is located in Pittsburgh. So just so you have a little bit of background on me. And um, I want to tell you that on my kitchen counter right now, I have um, about 10 brochures for cruises and travel that I have received over the last few weeks and about 20 more for our theater companies. Uh, all of whom are looking to get me back out and in the world post COVID and I look to those with great excitement. I don't think I have any brochures for nursing homes and long term care facilities, because that is not something that any of us are looking forward to planning about or looking forward to our life in that regard. So that's um, a little bit different. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about how we got here, the Jewish Healthcare Foundation, what our agenda is relative to seniors. So we've been working in this field for about the entire 30 years that we've existed. And in 1995, we were very focused on policy. And really it was then that we had an aha moment of understanding that not all seniors are the same and that there are well seniors, vulnerable seniors and frail seniors. And we needed to think differently about their present and their future if we were going to maximize the use of resources and what was provided in any community. Well, fast forward uh, about 20 years and we started to look at how people were living longer and how did we help them with better health? How did we help them with prevention and how did we help them with uh, finding the right physical, mental and social well-being? And then we began just a few years ago with our senior connections agenda, which is really focused on goals of life. What is your life going to be like when you're aging? And what are the things that matter to you? How do we go from institutional only options to community independence and involvement, from illness and debilitation mindset to wellness and frailty prevention, isolation and loneliness, which we know is critical. How do we look at engagement and safety? And how do we go from segregating seniors to intergenerational opportunities? Essentially, how do we go from the glass half empty to the glass half full? So we are always looking at healthy connections. We're looking at issues of companionship and access and healthcare quality and nutrition and exercise, housing and mental health, a whole array of interconnected issues. Because the goal is that seniors should be able to reach their full potential and stay well and safe in the community setting of their choice with a focus on how do we bring joy to aging, something that seems to have been lost in the last few years and particularly has been something we've all focused on in the past year as being a missed opportunity during COVID. So the key themes of our work right now are geriatric friendly and safe healthcare, not just long-term care, workforce adequacy, which I think we heard discussed by both of our other speakers, the right workforce, not just the right number of people, but people who care a lot about the seniors that they're taking care of. How do we adequately treat them and compensate them and train them so that they are partners in long-term care? How do we engage meaningfully as we age and how do we engage seniors in our presence as they age so that every single day has value from their perspective? And again, how do we look at safe, affordable housing options? So when we get to considerations for senior living models of choice, we may all be sitting here and saying, well, I know what I want. I'd want to live in a greenhouse model. I'd want to live in a model um, with other people my age or other people of different ages. But it's not always up to us. So part of the variables that we have to consider are physical and cognitive status of the individual who needs long-term care, financial resources, social and community supports of the individual, and then their personal wishes for their living situation. All of these come into play, and unfortunately, I wish I could tell you that they are all within your control, but they're not. Some of these are issues that are out of your control, but I would suggest that you could plan for the various scenarios and then have contingency plans depending on, on which 
fork in the road you are faced with in your life. So if we take a look at considerations for senior living, we have to ask ourselves the question, are all the options really open to you based on your functional status and the amount of resources you have available to you, some of the options may be foreclosed. And some of the options may be available to you as a couple and then may not be available to you as a senior or vice versa. Your financial situation may change, your functional status may change, and then unfortunately along with it, your options may change and your plan has to change. Now, granted, this is based on some models that are available in the States, but many of them we've just heard talked about are available throughout Canada as well. Everything from independent living to nursing homes, both of which are familiar to people, uh, to assisted living facilities or intergenerational campuses, uh, smart homes with a lot of technology, uh, continuing care retirement communities. And the lines that you see going to these models are not random. Those lines indicate what is available to people based on their functional status. So you may want to live in a senior village, but that really is only available to you if you are well. If you are frail, you may need to be looking at issues of a nursing home or a personal care facility because those are the only settings that can take care of your functional status needs. And that could be physical, that could be long-term physical or short-term physical, or that could also be based on your mental status and whether or not you have uh, dementia and whether or not it's progressing quickly or slowly. But it's not only the functional status that comes into play, it's also the income level. So if you take a look at your income level, again, there are, there are certain models that are available to you if you have resources. You can redo your entire home and make it a smart home. But that certainly is not an option that's available to everyone, and it's not often an option that's available to renters. And the same is true with some of the other models that have public funding options. In the United States, and I think in Canada to a certain extent as well, some of the options are available to you if you are of the lowest level of income, but not necessarily if you have resources to bring to the table, they are, so to speak, rationed. So your income level and your functional status are the two first things that come into play in understanding what your options are gonna be. But then beyond that, you have to think about the third F, which is your family. And so the question is whether or not you have family that are going to be part of your plan. And do we know whether or not they're gonna be part of your plan for financing or for providing care? Do you have an arrangement with other generations or other or siblings or other people within your family that maybe you'll go live with them or they'll come live with you? And do you know if you have a shared vision for what aging looks like for you and what you value in your aging? And is this something you wanna guess at or is this something that you wanna have as part of a conversation? And then it comes to the question of decision-making. So control, control over decision-making, I will tell you, is a privilege. And it is not something that should be taken lightly. So many people do not have the privilege of controlling their decision-making. Maybe that's because they suffer a stroke, or maybe it's because they have a decline in their mental status and they haven't made a plan. And so therefore they have lost the ability to plan for their own future. And the question is, are you making decisions for yourself as one person or as a couple? And are your needs the same? Are your desires the same? Is your trajectory the same? Those are important considerations that you have to have when you, it's nice to sit on the back porch and talk about what it is you'd like to have in 10 or 15 years, but that may not necessarily be what comes to play. And then are you the decision maker about your own future? And are you sure about that? So is it you, is it your spouse, is it your adult child? And do they know what you want? Do they know what you need? And have you communicated what you want and what you need to them? And if so, are they in agreement? And have they agreed to take on the role of your advocate, your navigator, your funder, your partner in your aging? So what I would say to you is in the last year, COVID-19 was a real teachable moment for all of us. And while I know you're gonna see in the, um, in the chat, the film, what COVID-19 exposed in long-term care, 
I will tell you that that film now is up for film festival awards at the Manhattan Film Festival and a number of film festivals across Canada and around the world because it was a moment in time to stop and think, how did we get here? I know the situation in Canada very closely. My family is still there. Uh, and we looked at nursing homes around the world and we realized that there were problems around the world in the past year and they weren't always with the facility and how things were managed. Some of it was around decision making. So we would be talking to a nursing home and they would say, well, they had four cases yesterday. They're going to transfer these people to the hospital. And I would always say to them, is that what they wanted? Was that in their plan? Had they communicated in writing that they did not want to be transferred to a hospital, that the nursing home was their home and that's where they wanted to stay. If you have definitive plans or ideas about what you want to have happen to you, you have to write those down and then you have to let people know what you wrote down and then you have to decide whether or not those are still the plans you want to have in place. My takeaways for people are that planning is not a one shot deal. Planning is something that you do and you do over and over and over again. You have to plan with your eyes wide open and you have to plan early and often and you have to revisit your plan. I don't think there's anybody on this call that if they were to get divorced would not immediately think of pulling up their will and changing their will. Well, if your physical status changes or your financial status or your family status changes, your long-term care plan almost necessarily has to change as well. So I would encourage people to not think about your plan for your future as a tattoo that cannot be changed, but I would think about it as something that represents the moment in time, your best thinking and your best advice to yourself. And then I would make a commitment to revisit it at any sentinel point in your life but also on a regular basis, whether or not you choose to do it every year on, um, uh, let's pick a holiday, we all have Labor Day or um, Thanksgiving or Tax Day, that you're going to look at this plan, dust it off and decide if it's still valid, decide if your decision maker is still the right decision maker. But if you want to maintain your autonomy and your independence, it's about taking your plan into your own hands. If you want to age with joy, don't lose sight of your personal vision. Own it. And then I think that you will be able to uh, control the variables you can control and accept those variables that are out of your control in partnership with others whom you trust. Okay, it's Nancy, Nancy to Nancy. So Karen, Moira, and Nancy, all super, super, super excellent professional resources. And again, with Women Worth and Wellness, we, we want to scratch the surface, we want to inform you, and we want to inspire you. We all know that this is a really, really, really important topic. And although I'm not um, a politician, I definitely pay, pay attention to politics the way we all do. If this is a priority in your world, know that there will be a provincial election next year and probably a federal election this year. We also know that it took a very, very long time for childcare to be supported. So elder care and ageism and everything that you've heard from these women is extremely important. And for the financial people who are on the call, by all means, Karen is spending a lot of time um, educating um, advisors and clients on how to do exactly what you've heard. And of course, Moira's book gives options so that you can think about what might work in your community. You know, more and more we're starting to hear about those tiny houses. So maybe that is part of a community where you are that you can build that into um, some plan planning, some municipal planning. So let's take some questions. Actually, Karen's offer, we will make sure that that's sent to each of you when we send the recording. So, but separately, you'll have their contact information. And these, each of these resources is available to you because I know there's a lot of interest from different people on uh, everything that you have to share. And uh, Nancy, your presentation was super on, um, you know, how important it is to plan and plan and plan and plan. The phrase that I love, which would make the golden years golden is to age with joy. And starting the planning at age 50, 60, I think I may have missed the boat on that, <laughs> but it's never, never too late. So let's take some questions. Now that lots of people are moving out of the city, there was one here from Susan Baca. Um, 
where is it? Susan, okay, when geriatric geriatricians are not available in a small town or nearby city, and when the MD doesn't have the time of day for the elderly, what are your suggestions for getting proper medical care for 90 plus year old parents with beginning signs of dementia? Um, I saw that question. Um, it is very problematic one. And um, the I've got a couple of ideas about, um, I don't know where these people are. I'm assuming they're in Ontario somewhere. But I've got some ideas about who the family can contact. And if uh, they get in touch with me, I'll do my best to answer the question. Okay, super. If, if I could add to that, um, I, I have found that geriatricians, and I, I've never met a geriatrician I didn't love and want to bring home for dinner. Um, but I will tell you that when it comes to some of these conversations that you need to have a number of times, I look to social workers and nurses some of whom have more time and uh, a lot more experience. So you may not get the same clinical insights from them if you're looking about disease progression, but if you're looking about services within a community, often the geriatricians don't have that same on the ground experience. And if you're looking for something in your own rural community, sometimes a health center in your own rural community will have a nurse or a social worker who could be helpful. Um, on a personal note, I have a brother, an 81 year old who was living on his own and doing just fine. But a friend visited him a couple of weeks ago, actually it's over a month ago, and said, I don't think you're well, I think you should go to the hospital. Well, of course, he wasn't well, he's in the hospital waiting to get into long term care. That's about six weeks ago, his mind is very lucid. And all he can say is, <laughs> get, get me out of here. So Karen, I remembered what you said a week ago when you did your presentation, that there are 6,000 spaces available, 38,000 on the waiting list. This is in Ontario. Those 6,000 can't be filled because of staffing. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is a huge challenge because those are minimum wage. And now you're in an environment where you could be, get sick and die. So McDonald's looks like a much better option. You know, these are the kinds of challenges that we have in society. And it isn't just that long-term care facility, it's also getting uh, home care workers to come mm -hmm. to your home. Mm -hmm. So Karen, maybe comment on that. Um, um, it's, very, it's very challenging to do anything in the, uh, the long-term care continuum right now. Home care is overwhelmed. And yes, there are empty beds in long-term care homes because uh, for two reasons. Uh, firstly, because some of them are in ward level rooms and those uh, rooms that had four beds are now cut down to two. Uh, and the other is, of course, that there aren't enough staff to, to uh, look after the, the people in these beds. And um, getting, getting what you need is very challenging. And I, I would say that if I needed home care right now, and I'm, I'm thinking this is your question, um, that I would be uh, calling around my trusted home care organizations to see uh, what the status is. Are they accepting new clients? And if they are, what the process is, uh, and so on and so on. It's, it's a minefield out there. Well, this is a classic example. He's 81 years old, living on his own was just fine. He said, my next stop is the funeral home. But of course, it doesn't work like that. So here he is in the hospital waiting to get into long-term care and his daughter is his power of attorney. There was no conversation. So now everybody sorts of, sort of scrambles. I mean, I'm, I'm getting involved and uh, we'll reach out to the politician in the area to see if they can do anything. But my point is having the conversation is extremely important. So your document that we'll make available to people will be very, very helpful. Okay, other questions. Actually, there yeah. was a question here. Has Moira connected with Abbeyfield, Canada? You're on. You're I, I, I saw that question and um, I haven't connected with them, but they look really interesting. It looks like they do some interesting work. They're not for profits and they um, have retirement homes. Looks like very small households as well. So strong community based. 
Um, and and I, I think, it, for example, the, the options that I discussed in my book, those are not meant to be definitive. Those are meant to show what is available. And, you know, you can choose or you can advocate with governments and operators mm -hmm. for what you think works in your community and operators are obviously able to do the same. And so I think that's the point is to see what is possible, to show what is possible. And because of what you just mentioned, the two upcoming elections to really right. push for change. Now is the time to do that. So it's not a prescriptive um, point about you choosing greenhouse uh, but it's to show what's possible and what can be done. Right. And whoever that politician is, ask them. And if they're not knowledgeable, then that in itself is a concern. And the one the one thing that really has to happen, too, is that, you know, we've got some great groups across the country that are advocating for change here in Ontario. Uh, the Ontario Health Coalition happens to be a major one. But what has to happen is seniors across this country have to mobilize and they have to tell all levels of government exactly what they want, exactly what they expect. Um, they're a very strong body. They're respected because they carry a lot of votes and seniors really need to get together and say this is completely unacceptable. And if you want our vote, you'd better bloody do something and do it quick. You know, we don't want four hours of care by 2025. 20, we want four hours of personal care now. Right. And um, so seniors really, and you can't, you can't ask family caregivers. They, they are so overwhelmed um, that they can't do this. But there's a lot of very healthy, wealthy seniors in this country who have got to step up and get together and, and demand change. One of the other things that I think it's important to advocate for is oversight of, and somebody mentioned it earlier, Karen, I think it was you, oversight of who owns these facilities. Make no mistake about it, when something is in the for-profit world, the for-profit means something to that bottom line, and that money comes out of somewhere. So unless there's some oversight of how much money has to go back into the care of the individuals in that facility, the care very often um, is diminished in some of those facilities. And once the, the for-profits go in, they look at these as real estate investments and not care investments. And long-term care is about care. And it should stay in the care world, for-profit or non-profit. So making sure that that care mission is still there, for-profit or non-profit, is really very important to the outcome in those uh, organizations. Excellent point. Um, who wants to comment on the grand tsunami that's coming as it pertains to women and Alzheimer's? <laughs> okay, hit it, Karen. Um, well, right now there's about 600,000 Canadians who suffer from some form of dementia. 65% um, of them are women. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's always been thought that uh, women because they live longer than men were prime targets for this disease. And it's true, once you hit 85, you've got a one in three chance of coming down with some form of dementia. But now they're looking at hormonal differences between men and women and uh, researching if these hormonal differences have something to do with the prevalence of Alzheimer's in women. Um, there is, you know, there's billions of dollars of research going on and uh, they still don't know what causes Alzheimer's, but what they are leaning towards is that there's a lot more that we can do to prevent the disease so, and we're not doing it. Right. So okay. back that up, right. The we're, whole health focus sooner yeah. rather than later. We're and not those happen to be the same things you can do to prevent heart disease. Exactly. What's good. So for it's exercise and nutrition. Yeah. It's sleep. And I'll be I'll be a goner soon. I don't sleep. So, but it's but it's a sleep issue is huge. But exercise, nutrition, and sleep, uh, and socialization, those are and, and keeping your mind going, whether it's crossword puzzles or Sudoku or memory games, those things are have all been proven to be very valuable, and they're they're important for heart disease, and they're important for um, also uh, any kind of dementia. That works. Okay. And get your get your hearing checked as well. Yeah. That's Wonderful. another piece. Of Thank it. you. Pardon. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, Dan Levitt. Dan Levitt says, if we stopped accepting an, a hospital-style institution placement admission and demanded a small household model care home, 
would this usher the future we desire? <clears throat> Hit it, Moira. Yes, in some <laughs> ways. Um, we, we need better options in the community. And, and I think that that is a, a key piece of this. So if we're gonna discuss the continuum, but having smaller household models makes a big difference. At the same time, if you still use, um, you might change the design of a home, which is important, but if you still use that old task focused system in place, then that traditional system is going to remain. So you'll know you'll have the workers rushing from task to task and so on. What you what the, the best combination is having smaller, more intimate households, but also having these different, more progressive philosophies of care. You can pick which one you want, but the combination of that will make all the difference. And always but constantly upholding those values as well. So they don't slip back. You don't want this to be a branding exercise. You want it to be a real values-based choice for a way to, to work and live. And, and when you say work and live, I think that one of the things that's, that's important is in most of these institutions, there are institutional checklists that they have to go through and they're always afraid of inspectors or inspections. So they, they almost teach to the test every day. When in fact, the only test that should matter on a daily basis is asking me as the resident, what matters to you today? That's Absolutely. A yeah, and, and, and the reality is that we are not even measuring um, the, the, the type of care or the type of options that people need to live well. We're measuring again temperatures of food intake and outtake of output of fluids and so on and so on. That is not a life, that is just a medical model. Right. Crystal? The next question is from Julia Bray. My mom is 92 and still in her own home and on her own. And as your previous question, in showing increasing cognitive, as, as per your previous, she's showing increasing cognitive impairment. So how do we prepare her for the possibility of not being able to stay at home? She says she will never go into a home. So she doesn't want to go into the kind of home that we're all envisioning that none of us would want to go into. But if there are models within your community, whether it's more of a home-like, does not be a small home, but it could be a, a home-like atmosphere, et cetera. People don't like change that's negative, but they, they are kind of more warm up to positive change. So some of those places you can go into for a week of respite, you know, sell it to mom saying, I need to go on vacation, do me a favor. Would I'd feel better if you were staying here for the week. And I'm not saying bait and switch that she never comes home, but if you expose her to something positive and different for a few days and weeks, that may put a toe in the water. Keep her, I'm, I'm not saying literally move her there in the middle of the night and, and don't look back, but I am saying if she feels she's helping you out as a caregiver by giving you a chance to take a vacation and giving you peace of mind, she might do it for a week. Maybe you do that for a week, a month, for a few months, and then the idea is more palatable. Good suggestion. Good suggestion. Okay, well, someone has put up a um, resource, Karen Terrell, dementia consultant, educator, author, blah, blah. So there you go, that's, that's, a, that's a possibility. The other point is many municipalities now are trying to deal with affordable housing. So why isn't this component part of that whole plan? Any comments, Moira? Yes, the, the, there is discussion about the need for, for example, some municipalities operate long-term care homes. And I think there's been a real move towards having, as we previously discussed, fewer for-profits and moving more towards not-for-profits or mun municipally operated homes because they do top up of the funding and so care is generally a bit better. There's a little bit more in there. The, the piece of this is, um, I think that's interesting, is related to federal and provincial infrastructure funding and how we could use that to benefit um, long-term care in terms of housing, because it is housing as well, um, to build some of these better, more modern progressive style homes. So that's one piece of it. I'm not sure if that answers the specific question. Someone well, else can weigh in as well. Exactly. 
Well, you know, the, the read the bar bar says read the affordable housing initiatives. They are failing miserably here in Ontario. And that's because nobody's quite sure which way to go. Yeah. But there's definitely a need for more. And if this is, as, you know, with uh, demographics, the boomers, there are a whole pile of people heading towards this, uh, this exit. And um, it really is a political topic that if you believe that it's important, you need to sit in the front row and ask those people questions about what is the plan. And sometimes it's worth turning to the politicians, we do this here, and, and making it in personal terms. Like, where would you want your mother to be? Where, you know, what, what have been some of your family situations and, and how would you want to see those be different? And if you do that, not necessarily embarrassing them in large groups, if you're able to get a smaller meeting with them, they often become champions on a personal level and that turns into champions on a policy level. Mm -hmm. Somebody had a comment in there about um, a, a difficult parent that they, they were going back and forth with and you couldn't get them to give a little. If you have the blessing of children, therefore their grandchildren that could be mediators, grandchildren have a different relationship with grandparents than any of us did, do and did with our parents. And very often they're able to, to talk to grandma or grandpa and bring up an issue and even allow themselves to be vulnerable about the grandparents picking on their lifestyle, that it's able to kind of sort of bring those together. And very often adult grandchildren or grandchildren who are in college, that sort of thing, make very good discussions for some of these difficult situations. Is there any books or articles or resources you could recommend to read? And I, I could get you some that, that you could send out, but, but it, it has been proven that the, the parental relationship, because there are decades of sometimes friction in those relationships, the relationships with grandchildren don't have those friction and they have the common enemy of the relationship in the middle. So it kind of allowed, it, it just, it's human nature in that regard, it's family dynamics but it somehow does create a more uh, loving way to get to those same answers. Yeah. Is there an easier way, what's the easiest way to locate alternative care versus traditional long-term care in one's community? And so you speak of Ontario, is there a, other resources to look for other provinces in the country? If you go to, uh, sorry, just making sure that I'm, yes. If, if you go to, for example, if you can find homes that do offer progressive care, you can speak to them. Even if they're not in your community, they can connect you with others. Or for example, there are some different philosophies that are established like the Eden alternative. And so that is in a lot of homes in more, more in Western Canada. There's a retirement home um, in Toronto, Christie Gardens that uses the Eden alternative. But you can connect with some of those organizations and they can point to you in a direction even if it's not specifically their model of care i find that most people in the care industry and those progressive philosophies are very generous with ideas and and time and they can help you out considerably also local seniors uh, groups are also some of them are more plugged into that than usual but i would reach out to the homes and the professionals to get that kind of advice and i would recommend schools of social work they often have to be up on those things because they put their students in for placements. So that they often have more up-to-date information than government. Very good. Well, there's also CARP, Canadian Association of Retired and in, in the US ARP. And of course, Moses with um, uh, Zoomers. This is something that he's really focusing on. There was an event, Karen, you gave me the heads up, I think for that a week or so ago. And one of the best approaches is aging in place. So if you say no to long-term care, I'm not going to one of those places. If you want to age in place, okay, what do we need to do? And it was interesting, the number of resources, you know, people who are in business with certain products and services to help you age in place. So wherever your community is, start asking questions about community uh, seniors organizations, and certainly, as we've all mentioned with uh, politicians, and uh, really inform yourself before it gets to the point where, you know, then you're shopping at the last minute. Hopefully, it never gets to that point. We all want to live long and live well. But as somebody said, none of us gets out of here alive. <laughs> so so the, end, the end will occur at some point in time, hopefully not for a very long time. 
Okay, any more comments or questions? Crystal, are there any there? Well, maybe maybe what we'll do is just do a wrap up with each of you for some final comments and recommendations. And certainly we'll make all of your information available to all of the participants and they'll receive a copy of this. And um, Karen's um, offer that, that uh, she has made. So Moira, do you wanna begin? I believe that this is the time, I said this in my um, talk, but this is a time of reckoning. And I think there is an opportunity to really create change here. And I'm not trying to be overly optimistic because I'm, you know, I, I think a lot has to be done to, in order to make that happen. But um, if people advocate, and I've seen this happening through the talks that I've been giving, for example, um, the University uh, Women's Federation of University groups, mm -hmm. very, very active. Uh, CARP um, organization, very active. CanAge, again, lots of different resources that people can connect with and push for change. But for me, that is the key point because we do need a continuum of care. But for those of us who are vulnerable and there will be many within that large demographic who will need care and don't have the, the caregivers at home to look after them or they've become fragile in doing so, we need uh, supports in retirement homes and nursing homes that allow us to have life and live well. How often are you in the STAR? When, when should we watch for your articles? I'm an investigative reporter, so I end up spending a fair bit of time um, working on stories. During the last year with the pandemic, I was writing constantly about isolation, long-term care, design of homes, change needed, and just some really tragic, sad stories as well. So it's um, right now that I'm back on the I team, it's a, a, my, my byline appears a little less, but you can always search the STAR website to, to find the stories that I've done. Okay, super, super. Okay, Nancy, do you want to give us some final comments? Sure, I think that um, most of the people who chose to be here this afternoon on this call are probably people who spend their lives in control of their lives or trying to be in control of their lives. I don't think you give that up as you age. I don't think you should. I think that you wanna make your final years at minimum worthy of the rest of your life and at best, your best years. And that's not gonna happen by happenstance. So I encourage you to think of those four Fs, your functional status, your financial status, your family status, and then making a plan that you frequently update. I think that's really important to make sure you communicate your plan, pick a decision maker, let them know that you are sharing decisions with them and that you're gonna bounce ideas off of them, but you're gonna help, you're gonna ask them to be a partner in your aging. And don't just assume that they know that that's them and that they get blindsided when uh, an emergency happens uh, as we saw so many times in this past year. People just didn't know how to help their family members because no one had ever asked them to. No, it was awful. So was start awful. the conversation sooner rather yes. than later. Yes. Get Moira's book and Karen's docs, and uh, that gives you a frame of reference and maybe copies for your family too. Karen. And watch the documentary on what COVID-19 exposed. Okay, very minutes. good point. Well, we're gonna, <laughs> they're gonna have a homework assignment that will go on for a week. <laughs> anyway, it's to inform and inspire. So we're doing that. Um, Karen, do you wanna um, share some final comments? Um, I agree with uh, with everything that Moira and Nancy have said. It's all uh, intrinsic to aging well. I just think that uh, as Canadians, we have become very complacent when it comes to planning for our aging and care needs. And it's up to us to take responsibility for, for these issues and not to rely on government because every time there's a change in government, things get cut back. And um, it... You know, I'd like, like Moira to be optimistic that change will come, but I think we suffer from a tremendous lack of political will in this country, a tremendous um, uh, unwillingness for the provinces to not only work together, but also to work with the federal government. And um, Maybe if they did, we would get change sooner. Um, we would get national standards. We would get all the things that we need for long-term care. So I'd like to be optimistic. I don't have much faith in government, but I do have a lot of faith in people. And as long as you know uh, what you need to do and you take the initiative, then we are 
essentially we're responsible for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Right. Very, very good points. The question to Doug Ford is, do we need another expressway 413 or whatever it is, or do we need more dollars directed this way? So those are the questions. Sit in the front row and ask the questions and inform and who knows, maybe we can make some good things happen. So we're all, what was age? So we age with joy. I love that phrase, Nancy. Okay, Paul, over to you. Paul is uh, with RBC. And of course, this is what he, his work is with a lot of his clients. And so I'll let you wrap it up with a final thank you. And then I'll talk about what's next. Thanks, Nancy. Oh, thanks for giving me a, a minute or so here. But I just, uh, yeah, I get the uh, pleasure of um, having the hard conversations, I guess, with a lot of people of, and, you know, having them think about this type of stuff. And th th this was great. And I'm blessed to, and lucky to be able to work with Nancy and Women Worth and Wellness and be able to take part in events like this and hear from, um, you know, hear from great speakers. And, you, you know, you made it, you made it especially uh, impactful because it was very personal and touching as well. But, um, um, you know, it brings up the importance of obviously planning around, you, you know, yourself, your well-being, your state, and structuring for you and your family. Because, of course, it's, it's, um, it's, uh, it's for the well-being of yourself and for your, uh, for your, for your family. So I made great points around, you got to consider the scenarios and the costs associated with that, of course, right? Um, and um, with long-term care and everything that goes around that. But Again, thank, thanks a lot, Karen and Moira and Nancy. You're excellent. It was very good. I'm very happy to be involved. So start the conversation and maybe it's some family conversations. Maybe you're the catalyst for some family discussions. Mm -hmm. But anyway, not, not popular topics, but one that um, needs to happen. Okay, Crystal, do you have anything you want to add on before I just do a final wrap up? No. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, great. All right, well, thank you again to everybody our um, excellent panelists, Moira, your book, we've got details there. Karen, your document, we'll get that to everyone. And Nancy, thanks so much. We know you're not here in Canada, but we know you're a Canadian at heart. And thanks so much for joining in in the conversation because uh, obviously your, pers your perspective makes a difference. And always a huge thank you to Crystal and the sponsors. And our next event is June the 10th for Father's Day. We started this year focusing on Women's Fearless Leadership Matters. And so for Father's Day, we have some, well, actually we have a guest speaker who's amazing, Angela Mondu, and she caught my attention because <clears throat> she said that when she was in high school, she came home and proudly told her parents that she'd been selected for the cheerleading team. And her father immediately said, why not the football team? So Angela, over her lifetime, has distinguished herself. She's now the CEO of Tech Nation and, you know, a great background in lots of different places. So she'll be the featured guest speaker. And then uh, we will have a panel of two fathers and a mother. And Crystal's going to be on the panel as well, talking about how parents raise their um, daughters to be confident and fearless. But in Crystal's case and Summer Bellamy's, they're raising young sons. So how do you raise young sons to be respectful of young girls so that they don't lose their confidence and their fearlessness? So it'll be a great event. It's June the 10th. And again, the timing is four till 5.30. If you are on our um, distribution, you'll be sent the invite. And of course, we're on all the social media channels. So everybody's welcome. And again, thanks to the sponsors, it's no charge. And that will be the end of our series for uh, the spring. So we can take July off and August and then figure out what we're gonna do in the fall. If you, have, if you have topics that you would like us to address, we'd be happy to do that. And if anybody wants to be a sponsor, we welcome them as well. We've got a fabulous network of terrific resources like these ladies today. So just give us your topic and we'll go find the guest speakers. Okay, thank you everybody.